I, uh, I turned on the, uh, the computer and I watched 45 minutes of the most riveting footage I have seen in a long time. 45 minute documentary entitled Agent Down. In fact, we have solutions here at Border 911. So when you leave today, in the next 48 hours, go to YouTube and watch Agent Down. It's a documentary about our next speaker. He's an amazing individual, um, served as a special agent with ICE, then with Homeland Security Investigations, and was on a mission in uh, Mexico, um, Mexico City, in an armored vehicle with a partner, and the uh, cartels ambushed our next speaker. So he knows of what he speaks, and uh, regrettably, um, his partner died in the ambush. Uh, our next speaker was shot up, survived, and truly believes now that he has a mission, a mission from God, if you will, to communicate the importance of this disaster, this catastrophe occurring. So warmly, warmly welcome someone who has put his life on the line of receiving multiple shots and is here today to speak to you, Victor Avila. Switch to office. Victor Avila from ICE. We got a shot. We got a shot. We are on the highway of Querétaro, Mexico. We've been shot and attacked on the highway. I am an ICE special agent. What is your name, you said, sir? Victor Avila. Please call Jerry Miles. I don't have another phone. So what did you Please you said? call Jerry Miles. We've been shot on the highway. Highway? What is the highway, sir? To where? Mexico, Querétaro. They know where I'm at. Uh, okay. Uh, try to remain online, please. You know, I've heard that uh, that call many times, and it still still affects me a little bit, especially when I hear it at a large volume. That was February fifteenth, two thousand eleven. Next month will be 12 years that my partner Jaime Zapata was assassinated next to me and I was shot three times and I'm here by the grace of God. And yes, this is personal. Border security and national security is personal to me and my country. And I'm doing as much as I can and thank you to the America Project for allowing me this platform to share not only my story, but what I continue to do on the border and what I continue to go down at the border interview the uh, illegals, and continue on a daily basis to stay in touch as to what is going on. That's the highway 57, where we were ambushed on our way back from uh, kind of a dubious mission, if you will. They sent us to pick up some equipment, some boxes, and on the way back, we were ambushed by eight uh, Los Setas cartel. We were pushed to the far to the right of the, and. Uh, semi-circle surrounded us, shot at our uh, armored vehicle over a hundred rounds. And these are some pictures of the, the remaining of the, the Suburban. We waited there on the side of the road for about 40 minutes before any help came. And in the law enforcement world, that's a long, long time to be there um, waiting. And let me tell you, I'm an American. Yes, I'm of Mexican descent. Yes, my parents came to this country legally. And I was a foreigner and I felt it there. But all of a sudden I knew that I wasn't welcome there. All of a sudden I felt very, very lonely on that road on Highway 57 because I wasn't a Mexican national. I was an American and I was representing the United States of America and the Zeta cartel knew it. Two of the weapons recovered are part of Operation Fast and Furious. You guys heard of that under the Obama-Biden administration? Yeah? Agent Brian Terry was murdered south of here. 
two months before our shooting. And two months later, our shooting happened. But you never hear Jaime Zapata's name because they buried that. It was, uh, they didn't want to see that another agent, a US agent, had been killed besides thousands of people have been killed. These weapons have been found all over the world. As a matter of fact, El Chapo Guzman had a 50 caliber uh, Fast and Furious weapon. The mass shooting in Paris that happened a few years ago was a Fast and Furious weapon. These guns ended up in Benghazi. A lot of what we, we, I'm gonna hear a lot of you, some of the information that, uh, that I'm gonna share with you is an overlap with, with Jason, because Jason does a great job with the cartels, with his expertise. But what, what we're doing here is we're showing you the threat, the imminent threat that these groups bring to our country, through Arizona, through Texas, through the border, and under this administration, how they've been widely uh, available to do carte blanche, do whatever they want. I talk a lot about Mexico, I, I worked in Mexico, I was in, um, a lot of these pictures that Jason uh, was showing, I was in Mexico, the 72 migrants that were murdered, they're like, Victor, go down there um, and figure out what happened. Well, these, the cartels have no regard for human life. These uh, migrants had been extorted, they had taken their money, they had no use for them anymore. So what they do is just execute them. That's what they do. And, um, you talk about mass murders and the U.S. gets this, this bad rap. Every time there's a shooting in the United States, oh, there you go, the, the guns, right? The United States, the bad, ma there's mass shootings in Mexico every day. Every day. There's more murders in Mexico happening than in any other country in the world. Mexico is, uh, the official number of journalists killed were 15 last year in Mexico. Not in the Middle East, in Mexico, the unofficial number is 30. So it's, it's dangerous to be a journalist in Mexico. So what are these guys? Are they terrorists? Jason and I agree they should be designated as such. President Trump got really close because he got with President uh, AMLO, Lopez Obrador from Mexico, and said, listen, we're going to designate these cartels as FTOs, we're going to start putting tariffs on the stuff that comes in through the border if you don't shape up. And they did. But that's how you have to deal with Mexico now. They have a role, a very big role to play here. And this administration doesn't care. We go down there, you know, Biden was down there a couple of weeks ago, and he's not there fighting for you and me. He's not there fighting for the American people. Mexico's wanting more money. I worked in Mexico under the Merida Initiative where we were giving him billions of dollars. I saw the buildings go up. I saw the armored vehicles, the helicopters, their equipment. I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. And what did it get us? Nothing. In 2008, when I started my Mexico tour uh, in Ciudad Juarez, which was the most dangerous city in the world, 350 homicides a month, the most dangerous city in the world, I thought, I was standing there once, it was a ghost town after 7 p.m. Um, only the cartel, the police, and we were on the street. And I thought, this is it. Mexico cannot go any lower. So, you know, try to be optimistic here. And I am optimistic and I am hopeful because I am standing here. And I'm thinking it can only get better. But I was very wrong. Very wrong. Mexico has been and gone down even further from that point, which was unimaginable to me at that time. This is what a cartel member looks like. I want you to start changing your uh, perception of what a cartel member looks like. He looks like you and me. He's dressed like me. He's, they're dressed like this. They're dressed in cowboy boots and cowboy hats as well. And so we need to understand that these are organizations way beyond drug gangs. I don't call them drug cart cartels anymore because they're involved in human smuggling, human trafficking. You see, when I, when I investigated all these, uh, and I've worked in Mexico, I've worked in Europe, I've worked in Portugal, Spain, and France, and I, and, and I saw those borders, and, I, and now you see their consequences in Germany and France of the open border systems they had over there. And 
the consequences of the violence and the crime and everything else that comes with it, uh, by rec they didn't recognize these criminal organizations as, uh, they're not street gangs, they're not, uh, you know, selling on the corner. These guys are highly sophisticated. Yes, they have the weaponry. Yes, they have the intel. They have the money. Look at the equipment that they're wearing. They have the intel. They have the capacity to distribute all over the world. So I tell people, think of them as Amazon. Global. They make billions of dollars distribution all over the world because they are present everywhere. And they're just, they love the propaganda videos, right? Sinaloa cartel telling you they're going to assassinate these two guys. And they love being the vigilante. We're here to protect the citizens from extortionists and rapists. They are the extortionists and the rapists. So what is, what is uh, international terrorism? Well, there it is. You tell me when you read this if they fall in there or not. Do cartels fit in this definition of international terrorism? Do they appear to be intended to intimidate, coerce civilian population? <laughs> for a long time. Let me tell you, Mexico has been terrorized for a long, long time. That's a failed state over there. And what people don't, it's hard to understand because people ask me all the time, can I go to Cancun? Can I go to Cabo? Yes, you can. It's going to be okay. But you know why? You just first, you, you need to know two things. One, the risk level is here. The risk level is here. Two, the resorts and all that is controlled by the cartel. They want it to be safe there. They want the people to come. They make millions of dollars of selling drugs to the tourists from all over the world. They want to keep that safe zones. It's not because the police in Mexico is keeping it zone, uh, safe. It's because the cartels want it that way. And yes, this is very important to me. Look at this. They occur primarily outside the territorial jurisdiction of the United States or transcend national boundaries in terms of the means by which they are accomplished. The persons they appear intended to intimidate or coerce or locale in which their perpetrators operate or seek asylum. I mean, <laughs> you can't get any clearer than that. And uh, Jason had mentioned a little bit of uh, what these guys are involved in. And this, this list is not exhaustive. There's, there's so many, the, the mass murders, the car bombs. You see, when I investigated these, uh, the drug cartels, we investigated the, they dealt with drugs. That's what they were. And we had the human smugglers and human traffickers separate. It was separate. They have now merged. The cartels have taken over all of it. The cartel will now oversee the human smugglers and the traffickers. I ran the Global Trafficking in Persons Initiative while I was in Mexico, and it was a great initiative, and I, I was able to uh, help dismantle a lot of human trafficking uh, uh, organizations and rescue a lot of women and children that were trafficking to the United States. This smuggling and trafficking are two different crimes and it's important to understand there's a big difference. A lot of the illegals that you see that are coming in, whether they turn themselves in or whether they're smuggled, they are paying the cartel a fee. And that's it. It ends there. They might be extorted, they might be raped, they might be do all these things, but they're smuggled and it's over. The trafficked victim, there has to be forced fraud or coercion. They're exploited, usually for sexual exploitation, but also for forced labor purposes. And I rescued them in Houston, Miami, New York, Atlanta, in these horrific, horrific conditions. And these are the main ones. Jason went over some of these guys. These are the ones that, if you would designate these, I would start with the Sinaloa cartel because Sinaloa cartel is probably the most powerful one in the world right now. But Cartel Jalisco New Generation is right behind them with the money. And this is what these guys want. A lot of times I get the argument, well, they're not foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS or the Taliban or Al Qaeda because, uh, you know, Al Qaeda wants to, they want to kill America. Well, what do you think the cartels are doing? They're killing 110,000 murders with fentanyl. When's the last time you heard of ISIS killing 110,000 people? We need to wake up. 
We need to get to our elected officials at the local level, it starts. Not the federal. You start here in your neighborhood how you make a difference and get them to understand the threat through China. Through China. Because China has been present in Mexico for a long time. And they have bringing the chemicals and the precursors and they love using the cartels because the cartels are getting rich and the cartels love distributing this poison to the rest of the country. And we have a lot of corruption. That guy that I'm walking there, that I'm holding on to, yeah, that, that's me, I look a little different, um, is a corrupt border patrol agent. Why? Why do we see that? Because the cartel has a lot of power, a lot of money, and they get and they infiltrate a lot of times into our own U.S. law enforcement. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. This guy was allowing illegal aliens to go through the checkpoints in New Mexico at $500 a head. So, you know, I, when I investigated the drug trafficking, it's now has changed. The, how, how Jason told you about the shift and how the cartels have shifted and moved. And that's so true because when I investigate it, you get the, you get the source, you get the, the seizure, you start working your way up to get one arrest and the next guy and you work your way up. And it's a two year investigation. We need to get away from that. That, does, that formula does not work anymore. We need to go after these guys totally and that's why we need these type of legislations to designate them as FTOs, to be able to go straight at them. And what, where do you hit the cartels? You hit them with the money. Oh, by the way, I want to share this with you guys. While I was backstage, this came up on the Fox News alert. And I said, I'm going to share it with you guys because since our fiscal year, right, the federal government starts in October. So in the, the last 120 days, 293,993 known gotaways. 300,000 people, known gotaways, not the ones that walked up, that we know that Border Patrol saw on a camera, that a sensor picked them up, and we didn't get to them. 300,000 since October. This is not sustainable. We have no idea who these people are. On top of that, we have this, the smuggling. Now, you guys remember the, the 53, the horrific death of the 53 that died in the back of that tractor trailer? Well, as, as, as horrific as those deaths, and I investigated those cases and as an agent, people, a lot of people don't know that all the illegals in that tractor trailer, there were 16 survivors, by the way, they were all Mexican nationals and Central Americans. Because I was down there, I was on the border in Eagle Pass when that happened. And I had gotten the news, and I was seeing a group of 150 coming in, and they were coming from Venezuela, Cuba. Not one Mexican, not the last several times that I've been to the border, not one Mexican national, not one Central American. I go, what's going on? Because they were repelling them back with Title 42. Doesn't mean they stop coming. It means they get smuggled. So in the back of that tractor trailer, 53, all of them, all of them were from Mexico or Central America. 17 of those? were hardcore criminals. And no one, des no one deserves to die that way. But why? Why are they coming like that, undetected, in the back of tractor trailers, in the back of trunks, camouflaged, coming through the desert, avoiding detection altogether? They don't want to come up. You can come up right now to the Border Patrol and turn yourself in. They'll check you. This processing, by the way, is it's nuts, it's, no, it's not vetting. They're not vetting anyone. And there's no proper vetting, so uh, individuals get through all the time. 150 now, and that video, I think when I did that video, it was 116, 150 known terrorists on the terror watch list and no fly list that we know about. These are individuals in the, under a tra uh, dump truck. That's gravel on top of them. Under hay, anywhere you can imaginable, they'll bring them in. 
and of course the children. The last times that I've been to the border, my goodness, the, uh, the airports in El Paso, Harlingen, McAllen, San Antonio, Del Rio, it's just full of illegal aliens, and they're all flying, flying commercial. I've flown with so many illegal aliens, and I'm thinking, you know what, this, is, this is, can't be right. This is, why is the TSA complicit? Why is American Airlines complicit? Why are they allowing this to happen when I took a picture of this little young boy next to me? That guy is not his father. People ask me, how do you know he's not his father? I had already talked to him. It's happened to me many, many times. And I interview them. And they, about them, they know everything. Oh, I'm going to go meet my brother. I'm going to go work here. Blah, blah, blah. What about this little girl? What about this little boy? They have no idea. If it was your child, you'd be excited. I'm in the U.S. I'm going to put him in school. Da, 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 da. They have no clue because it's not theirs. They're trafficking the child. Who knows where this boy is right now? Can you imagine me feeling? That's my subject matter expertise is human trafficking. And I'm sitting there next to this child. I have no idea, no control as to where they're going. But this administration will give up, give them up to sponsors. Anyone that says they want to be a sponsor, and they'll take them. So, just I want you to see that in fact you can do it legally, and the federal designation of the FTO goes through the U.S. Department, U.S. State Department. That's where it goes through. That's where the, the channel will go through the, uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act. And it goes through OFAC because what would it do if you designate these cartels as foreign terrorist organizations, where do you hit them? You hit them in the pocketbook. Immediately you get to seize all their assets and their money. That's what the cartels want, money and power. There's the bigger picture we know, China, Venezuela. Um, and I'll tell you a story because uh, Patrick Byrne yesterday brought up Venezuela and the cartel of Los Soles. And I got a call from the uh, uh, South Texas, the hill country, from one of my sources and says, hey, I saw a guy with a 4% tattoo on his neck. And I used to be a gang intel when I worked at the state. And I'm like, I don't know that one. I don't know 4%. What does that, what does that mean? So I put it out. And my, with my contact to see what the heck a 4% is. He was at an HEB, which is a local grocery store in Texas. I get the call back and says, hey, Victor, that's a bad guy, man. The 4% is from Cartel, is Venezuelan, Cartel de los Soles, and the 4% uh, signifies a division or neighborhood of that cartel in Venezuela with the name of the, I forget the name of D, which is, that's why it's the four. And I go, where, where was this guy? I go, in Hill Country, and down south in Texas, like he's there. That's where, they're everywhere. They're here. They're here in your community. They're walking into the grocery store where you go shop. And what does it do? You're able to then take these guys and take their assets, and I say that all these gangs in Chicago, the Black Gangster Disciples, the Latin Kings, and all these big uh, other people that distribute the drugs for the cartels, if you would designate the Sinaloa Cartel and the Cartel Jalisco New Generation as a terrorist organization, just like ISIS, I think eventually these members, these gang members are going to be like, hey, I don't want to associate with a terrorist organization. I'm not a terrorist. Because if they would, if you start talking to somebody from ISIS right now, you're going to get a knock on your door. Well, the same thing, it would happen with the Sinaloa cartel. That's how we kind of go and infiltrate. Yes, it's a little cumbersome. We need state and locals on board on this. But it, it, we're at that point. We're at that point where these cartels are having a major, major impact in our, in our uh, state. That's a cartel member uh, walking in, in Texas at a ranch fully armed, and of course, a lot of illegals coming through the ranches. And the ranchers in Texas tell me, I've, I've interviewed a lot of them, said, Victor, we have guns in Texas. We can shoot this guy, we'll kill him. 
but we're afraid because the cartel is going to send the wrath and murder our families. They're afraid to do that kind of action because they don't feel they're going to get the... Uh, we thought this was a, uh, some kind of device. Uh, apparently it was a Mexican firework, but they put it out there. But here's the, the, this is one of my biggest things and the reason why I fight is because we have a crime problem in the United States of America at all levels, right? Not only do we have a crime surge, uh, we have a problem with justice and the justice, criminal justice system where a police officer will do their job, an agent will do their job, arrest them, but guess what? The DA lets them go, right? No charges. Or revolving door, uh, bail reform, all that, right? We have a problem. So why do we need illegal aliens coming here and committing more crimes? That guy in the middle in the red shirt killed a Houston police officer. This guy killed a three-year-old girl on uh, her tricycle on a cul-de-sac. These guys are all sex offenders. And these I have so many examples over and over and over and over and over again of these people coming to commit crimes, especially these, the special interest aliens, Department of Homeland Security calls them SIAs. And I've interviewed them when I was in Mexico, I got access to uh, some of the detention facilities where they were being held. And this is 10 years ago. And they've been in Mexico for a long time. As a matter of fact, they have set up shop in Mexico. And now that Biden has been there for two years, they love it. They're bringing everybody from the Middle East. And we're, they're bringing them from special interest countries. Somalia, Iran, Bangladesh, you know, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen. These are individuals that are coming from countries that are sp sponsored by terrorism. And we have, we have no idea, no idea what their intention is. I interviewed them and I tried to get that information from them. They wouldn't say a word. One would say, I'm going to New York, that's it. That's about all I could get out of them with an interpreter. And these guys, different identities. One identity in the southern part of uh, Mexico, one different identity in Mexico City, and a third identity when they got to the border. We started doing biometrics and uh, scanning their eyes to make sure that we at least had to know that it was the same person that we were uh, dealing with. This guy was close to where I live, in Garland, Texas. He got inspired when the whole debacle with the Taliban last August, remember that? He gets all inspired because the Taliban won and took over. And so he calls a Lyft driver to take him to the Plano Police Department. He assassinates her, goes into the Plano Department, tries to shoot up, and he ends up being killed by the police. But he left a note that he was inspired by the Taliban for doing that. This guy tried to bomb a church. They're here. They're here. You heard Jason mention this guy? Well, it happens to be where I live. And he just got caught last week, or two weeks ago now. This guy's a bad guy. This guy is, you know, everybody had all the attention of one of the Chapo's sons. And, you know, um, in 2019, when El Chapo's son, Oviedo, was first caught, it was caught with the help of HSI, my agency that got a, what they call a provisional arrest warrant. You get an arrest warrant in the United States of America, and then you present that arrest information to the Mexican government, and then the Mexican government issues a warrant based on that information. And in 2019, we went for him, we got him, and then AMLO, because the Sinaloa cartel threatened to kill everybody, he let him go, and, um, and uh, he kneeled. He kneeled to the Sinaloa cartel. They kill people anyway, and this is a war, and there was an opportunity for him to set it, you know, face them uh, for the first time face-to-face -face in conflict, and he kneeled before them, and that really set a terrible precedent, and so now they did it again, and, and you saw what happened, and Jason showed you the videos of the firefights. Well, this guy then gets arrested a couple of days after, uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. We thought maybe it's political because Biden was going to go visit um, Mexico, and Mexico loves to do that. You know, let, look, we're doing something to fight against um, terrorism or against these cartels. 
And then you, you, this was just uh, the other day. Uh, MS-13 gang member killed a 20-year-old woman, autistic woman, strangled her to death. Illegal alien, MS-13 gang member from El Salvador. Mara Salvatrucha, that's what MS th stands for. These guys are, are very, very violent. In this month alone, 38 sex offenders just in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas have been apprehended. That we know of. That we know of. You got to remember, it's not just uh, the new people that are coming in. It's the ones that were here, got convicted of crimes, got deported, and now they're coming back. And serious crimes, sex offenses against children, trafficking, drug trafficking, murder, and they're coming back. These guys are in a kidnapping scheme. And this happened just last week. The cartel hit in California. You guys read that in the news? I don't know how widespread that was, but I did a couple of interviews about this. The cartel went and wiped out a whole family, including a 10-month-old baby. Executed a 10-month-old baby and her 16-year-old mother and a 72-year-old person. This is, what the car, this, is a, this is a cartel hit in California in a farming community. And they asked me, what, what, what is the cartel? Listen, the cartel is involved in the lime trade, in the avocado trade, in the petroleum trade. They're involved in a lot of other things than besides fentanyl and meth that are killing us as well. They're global. What we're trying to do here is to give you some solutions. And there are solutions. And we're gonna give you uh, the opportunity to be able to do something in your community, because that's where it starts. A lot of people say, well, what can I do, Victor? What can I do? You could do a lot. Um, you're, you know, you guys are the, you guys are the, the 10 percenters. There's a book that I read called The Gift, the, the Gift of Fear. And he talks about being a 10 percenter because 90% of people in an emergency will do nothing. Will do nothing. They won't move. But 10% will react. You're the 10 percenters. Be a 10 percenter. Be involved. Go to the school board meeting. Go to the city council meeting. Go to the county commissioner meeting because those people, by the way, here in Phoenix, in New York, in Yonkers, New York, where I did an interview, they're going out of control over there. Guess what? They're having issues in schools with the illegals. The kids don't speak Spanish. Uh, they're illiterate in Spanish. They don't speak English. And they have a lot of medical conditions. They have problems at the school levels. But who's putting them in there? The people that you elected. Why do they keep on putting them first? Oh, you're so in in inconsiderate, Victor. Listen, listen. This is a sovereign country, and we have uh, a thing called the United States Constitution, and it's time that we respect our law and order, just like Mexico does to us. They throw their sovereignty on us all the time, and every other country does that. They are allowed to put their country first, but as soon as we want to do it, we're called names for doing it. And I'm tired of the left setting the narrative we're going to set the narrative. We're going to show you the truth. We're going to show you the truth and bring you the solutions. And I look forward to speaking to you more uh, a little bit later with the panel. And that's going to be so impactful because these are real people that have been affected by uh, these criminal aliens. Uh, thank you so much for your attention today. I appreciate it. Look, I got one question for you, Victor. Come here. Uh, can't let these guys just walk off. When, when I was, uh, I've been wanting to ask him th this question for quite a while. When I was watching Agent Down on YouTube, please go there, um, I was very curious what was going through your mind as the bullets were flying through into the car. I get that question a lot. You know, a lot of people say, you know, my, my life flashed before my eyes. Mine did not. I was, I was fighting for survival. And I went through all stages. I went through the fight, the flight, and the freeze. I went through all of them. Part of the, sh the shooting, there was basically two shootings, the initial one, 
and then we crashed and tried to get away from them, and then they drove away, but one of the SUVs turned around and parked right in front of the Suburban, and you saw the two shots in front of the, of the windshield. They came up to the windshield and just tried to penetrate that glass, and I froze there. Couldn't do anything. They were trying to make sure they were, I was dead, and so I went through all that. I was just adrenaline, a lot of adrenaline. God bless you, man. Thank you. An Appreciate American it. hero, ladies and gentlemen.